They're going to stop worrying so much about Great Britain and concentrate more on themselves, and we'll talk about that. So the overall topic is moving towards independence. And I just kind of want to set up the first subtopic by just talking about a couple of things in general that kind of get you focused in. By 1763, you've got to remember that Great Britain's empire from established claims circled the world. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't just the American colonies. They had a huge empire. Okay, the American colonies were just part of that empire. And anytime you have a, an enormous empire like that, you're going to have some problems maintaining that or keeping control of it. Okay? You might can compare it to a, it's probably a lot easier to maintain discipline in 10 sleep high school with 25 kids in it than, than it would be to maintain discipline in Casper Natrona with maybe 2,000 kids in it. So the bigger empire you have, the harder it is to maintain that empire. And one of the problems that the, that Great Britain was going to face in governing their entire empire, one of the problems was going to be the American colonies in the New World. They were going to have difficulty maintaining those. Now it's kind of interesting because the first person to really anticipate that there would be a problem in America wasn't someone from Britain. It was a French official by the name of Count Verzen, who's on your ID sheet. And Count Verzen, not on there? No. Oh, I can't believe I missed that. Well, I'll write it on the board for you. I'll have to make sure I spell it right there. Okay, so the man that first anticipated that the British were going to have a problem in the American colony were Count Verzen. V-E-R-G-E-N-N-E-S. Count Verzen. So one of the first men to anticipate a problem in the American colonies for the British was a French official by the name of Count Verzen. And I'm going to read a quote that he stated. And you really don't need to write the quote down. If you were interested in writing it down, you could get on the video and, and do that. But I want you to listen to the quote, and when you get into the senior class next year, we do all kinds of different quotes, and we don't necessarily mandate you write them down. I usually tell you the ones I want you to write down, but I want you to kind of get the idea behind them. So this is what he said. He said, quote, The American colonies stand no longer in need of England's protection. England will call on them to contribute towards supporting the burden they have helped to bring on her and they will answer by striking off all dependents. So what is Count Verzane saying? What is he saying in that? We're going to become independent thinking. Okay? We're going to have a time come where, don't, where we're not in need of England's protection. We'll protect ourselves. So we will call, England will call on the colonies to help them run this entire empire worldwide and our answer is going to be no we don't want to do that we want to be more independent and he predicted that you know way back in like 1763 and 13 years after his prediction what are we involved in the revolutionary war so he was right so this guy really had some interesting forethought when he was thinking about the American colonies, and he wasn't even from Britain. So that then will take us to our first subtopic, which is problems faced by the British in governing their empire. And I'm going to basically tell you about three major problems that Great Britain's going to have to deal with their empire. And what do I mean by their empire? Just the American colonies? No, I mean all of their empires. Okay? So problems faced by the British in governing their empire and Great Britain is going to have three major problems to deal with in governing this vast worldwide empire. The first problem, number one, the need for new taxes. The need for new taxes. This is the first problem that Great Britain is going to have to deal with in governing their vast empire, was the need for new taxes. Now I'm going to explain why that's a problem. Between 1689 and 1763, 
between 1689 and 1763, Great Britain fought four wars across the globe. Between 1689 and 1763, Britain fought four wars across the globe. What comes with four wars besides loss of life and gaining or losing a property? Debt. And that's exactly right. Very good. These worldwide conflicts left Great Britain very heavily in debt. <clears throat> now, when you are successful in worldwide conflicts, what are you going to need money for, mainly? What? You've got all this property, what are you going to need to do with that property? Protect it. So they need, they're very heavily in debt because of the wars. Well, they were successful in these wars and they gained a lot of property. Well, they needed money to maintain their military and naval defenses so they could protect that property from other countries taking it from them. They fought and spilled blood for it. Once they obtain it, they need to be able to control it and keep it. And you need money to maintain their military and navy to cross the world to do that. Now, who is, did they expect to pay these war debts overall? Basically, who did they expect to pay, pay these war debts? The people within the British Empire, including who? The American colonists, because after all, they're British servants, so to speak. So British leaders expected all people under British rule across the globe to help with this, including the American colonists, because these colonists were loyal subjects of the King of England. They were Brits. They were not independent. They were a member of the British crown, so to speak. So they're wanting the colonists to pay for the defense of the empire, which would include what? Their own defense. Okay. So in a way it makes sense. So again, British leaders expected the American colonists to help pay the English war debts as the colonists were loyal subjects of the King of England. In addition, British leaders believed the colonists ought to help pay for the cost of their own defense. So that was the first problem that Great Britain's going to have in dealing with governing their vast empire, was the need for new taxes. And we're going to go into specifics why that becomes a big problem. Okay. The second problem that Britain has is the future of Florida and Canada. British had to solve the issue of Florida and Canada. Where did the British get the lands of Florida and Canada from? Which one? The French and Indian War. So all of a sudden they win the French and Indian War and they've got Florida and a vast amount of land in Canada that they have to deal with. Okay? So think about this in perspective. So who did Florida belong to? Spanish. Spanish. Who did Canada belong to? French. French. So these governments of both Florida and Canada are going to have to be reorganized from Spanish and French rule to those of Parliament. Okay? They have to do that. Now, who's living in those areas? American colonists? No. no. The Spanish are living in Florida and the French are living in Canada who are bitter enemies of Great Britain, how easy is it going to be to govern those people? That's a big problem. So that was the second problem that Great Britain had to deal with, is what to do with the future of Florida and Canada. Lands they gained by the French and Indian War, that now they had to re-govern because Florida was under Spanish rule and Canada was under French rule, and most of the people that still live there are Spanish and French, and they're not real interested in being governed by the English. That's going to be a problem. And the third problem they had to deal with at this point were the western lands. Now what do I mean by the western lands? Not west of the Mississippi, you're too far yet. West of the, what's the big mountain range? Appalachian. Appalachian. So all lands west of the Appalachian Mountains are called the western lands. And we will expand past the Mississippi, but we're not there yet, right? So. Another area that the British government was forced to deal with were the western lands. That would be lands between basically where? The Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. Very good. Who lived there? Indians. Very good. Indians lived there. 
A lot of Indian tribes are living there. Why? Because that's where they lived from many, many, many decades before. Now all of a sudden, who are they under? British rule. And they don't like it much. They feel like they're being treated unfairly by the British. And because of these bitter feelings, they made two demands upon, upon the British government. The Indians did. It's because of their feelings that they were being treated poorly by the Brits. These Indian tribes all of a sudden made two demands upon the British. Now, where are the Indians going to get their goods? Trade. And they complained. Well, I shall, I'll back up. Here's one of the demands they made. They demanded that Great Britain lower the prices of goods that they were trading with the tribes. Because what did they do when they got control of that area? Raised their prices, and the Indians didn't like it. Thought they were being treated unfairly. So the first demand the Indians made upon the British was to lower <coughs> prices of goods that they were trading with the tribes. They thought they were being robbed, so to speak. Highway robbery. They were charging them way too much for those goods once they became British citizens, so to speak. And to protect themselves, what was their second demand? They wanted the British to supply them with what? Weapons, Weapons and ammunition. Weapons and ammunition. So the Indians, who felt they were being treated unfairly by the British in the Western lands, placed two demands on the British Parliament. One, they demanded that Great Britain lower prices of goods traded with the tribes. And two, they insisted that the British supply the tribes with weapons and ammunition. Now, what else might... Yes, my dear? This is just me, but doesn't supplying someone with defensive weapons not really make sense? Yeah, and, that, and we're going to see how they respond to that. That's a very good question, yeah. Now, what might be another fear that the Indian tribes have? Now, see, that's engaging, man. That's what I like. She's got a great point. We're going to answer that. What's another thing they might be fearing now that Britain has control of the lands west of the Appalachians? which were basically wilderness and where they lived. What? No. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. It's, it's not really that is a dumbass question for an honor response. Dumbass response. Don't say stuff like that. That doesn't, make, that doesn't do any good to anybody, does it? That doesn't do any good. What are they in fear of? Losing their land. What? Losing their land. To who? British. British farmers. Very good. In addition to these other paranoias, the Indian tribes were, feel, were fearful that colonial farmers would cross their area, cross the Appalachians in the western lands, and what were they concerned they were going to ruin? Were these Indians farmers? Hunters, their hunting grounds. Very good. So what happened is these Indian tribes were also fearful that these colonial farmers, because they would have the right because the western lands are owned by Great Britain, correct? They were afraid these colonial farmers were going to come, come over the Appalachians and ruin their hunting grounds. Now, we'll get back to Kylie's great engagement when she said, why would you give people weapons and ammunition that you knew they might turn against you? Very good question. The point is the British government refused any of these demands. And so how did the Indian tribes feel about that? They were very resentful. Very resentful. Very, very resentful. But when, when people become resentful, what do they tend to do? Because right now Mason's a little resentful toward me, right? So what are you thinking? So what would he, what might he do to get even with me in, a, in an abnormal situation? He might strike back. Very good. And that's what the Indians did. They banded together under the leadership of one Indian chief, Ottawa Chief Pontiac. Very good. So in retaliation to the British not following their demands, Several Indian tribes band together under the leadership of Ottawa Chief Pontiac. O-T-T-A-W-A. O-T-T-A-W-A. Very good. Yeah, that's basically think about that. Now, what did Chief Pontiac and his followers do? They promptly destroyed nearly all British forts in the Western land. Yep. Okay, the point about what several tribes banded together? Yeah. Okay, because they were upset that the English would not meet any of their demands, several Indian tribes <coughs> banded together under the leadership of Ottawa Chief Pontiac. And what they did is they went out 
and promptly destroyed nearly all of the British forts that were located in the western lands. And this effort on the part of Chief Pontiac and his followers became known in British history as Pontiac's Conspiracy. So this British, the British referred to this action on the part of Chief Pontiac and the Ottawa Indians and other Indian tribes that joined in as Pontiac's Conspiracy. Did What's that? What did they okay, now we got to listen better because I repeated that about nine times. Chief Pontiac and his followers promptly destroyed all British forts in the western lands. Destroyed them all. And the British didn't like that. And they referred to that action on the part of Chief Pontiac and the Ottawa Indians as Pontiac's Conspiracy. How was it a conspiracy? I don't know. That's what they called it. Now, this doesn't end here. There's more violence on the part of this group in the western lands. So what's Parliament decide they have to do? Well, not so much fight back. Before you fight, you usually do what? Kind of negotiate or put a policy together. So that's what Parliament decided. They thought, holy moly, we better get in gear here and put together a policy because things are out of control in the Western lands. We've got to get some policy together to try to meet what? Some of these demands. Okay? So they ignored it at first, thinking, well, they'll just take it. You know, they are going to fight back. Well, they did. They fought back. And because of that fighting back and that rebellion, Parliament thought they better get together and pass some policy to get things under control and maybe listen to some of those demands. Now, unfortunately, the British government and the colonists couldn't agree on what that policy should be. That's what happens sometimes when you're trying to put together policy. Okay, put together policy in the school, maybe the administration, the teachers don't agree on that, how that policy should be put together. Okay, so the British government and the colonists could not agree on what policy to apply in the lands west of the Appalachian Mountains, and so it became a little bit of a problem. So we'll talk a little bit about reasons why the colonists and British government could not agree on policy. <coughs> Okay. There was a certain group of colonists that urged the government to keep settlers from moving to the western lands. Which sounds a lot odd. What colonists would not want to see settlers moving to the western lands? What group of colonists? Very good. Fur trappers. Because the more people that go in that area, the less... Or, excuse me, the more people go in that area, the more competition there is in the fur trade. So the, some colonists urged the government to keep settlers from moving to the western lands because they were interested in the profitable fur trade. Now, what colonists might urge the government to open the western lands to farming? Farmers, Farmers but who else would maybe benefit from that? Plantation what? Plantation owners, yeah. I'm not so much plantation owners, that's a good... Landowners, remember there were speculators that bought land over there? They would like that, wouldn't they? Because they could sell their land for a profit. Who else, Mason? Well, He's good. totally going to redeem himself right here. Let's hear it. Well, I was going to ask what the fur trappers mainly were trapping. Was it still beaver when it was east of Mississippi? They were, that was the main thing, yeah. But they were, they were, it was so wide open. I mean, they, they had deer. I mean, they had all kinds of things. But the beaver was the big thing. But, it, but redeem yourself now. Now, what, what other group other than land, you know, speculators, landowners, that people that bought land to sell for profit would be excited, would want settlers, farmers to move, besides farmers? They want farmers to move. Okay. So maybe somebody who didn't want them back east anymore. Well, that, that's not bad. But what are farmers going to do when they're over? Farm. And then what are they going to do? <laughs> now, listen, what are they going to do with those crops? They're going to sell them to who? Merchants who are going to sell them for profit. So merchants would be another group of people that would be in favor of farmers being able to go into the western lands. And then if you can go down the line, the people that ship the goods to England, you know, the ship owners are going to like that. I mean, you can just go down the line. The problem with this is, said in the background, are the Indians, because they're disputing 
conflicting claims there, right? There's all kinds of conflicting claims in the West. And who is that between? Colonists and Indians. Well, Indians are thinking, wait a minute, we've been here forever. What makes you think that you have any claim to any of this land west of the Appalachians? It's ours. We've been here since the earliest times. Well, you'll find out throughout this course that we've done this to the Native Americans forever, and we continue just to push them farther west and west and west until if it was up to us, they'd be in the Pacific Ocean and drowning. I mean, seriously. So these conflicting claims between the colonists and the Indians were very evident because their point is, hey, we've been here since the earliest times. What gives you a right to claim any of this? In essence, the Indians didn't believe that the colonists had any claims to the land. They were the first to settle it many, many, many years before the settlers even came to America. So we have conflicts there. So the third reason, which was a little more detailed, that the British government's going to have a hard time uh, controlling their empire was because of the issue in America in the western lands. Now that'll set us up for our next subtopic, because, who, because who's going to have to solve these type of problems? Good leaders, right? And our subtopic tells us weakness of British leaders setting the stage for trouble tells us that that's not what we have in England at this time of crisis. We have a weakness of British leaders, which set the stage for trouble in the colonies. Remember, we're moving toward independence here. That's the topic. Now, again, to solve all these problems that the British government had to deal with concerning their empire, they needed leaders in Parliament that would have the following ideals. Okay, this is the type of people they needed in Parliament to make this work. Somebody with a quality, broad education, like you're getting here fifth period today. Okay, somebody with a quality, broad education. You have to have educated people to be your leaders. Now, you're going to have to have two different types of solutions here in the colonies. You're going to have to have solutions to satisfy the needs of the colonists, and you're still going to have to 